Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it, and without further ado, let's go. So, I've got this crazy story about my neighbor, let's call her Karen, and how she managed to mess everything up by messing with a tree. Karen and her daughter own a house on my street, which is sort of private even though it's not gated. There are seven other people living on this street, including me. Our street shares many resources and services that set it apart from the rest of the community. It was originally empty land in the middle of an existing neighborhood, bought privately by a group who built houses and sold them. Because of this, we have a homeowners association, HOA representative, and we share costs for things like lawn maintenance and street repairs. For instance, we split the cost of repairing street lights, and the same people mow all the lawns on the street at the same time. Karen and her daughter are rarely seen on our street. Instead, they rent their house out to newcomers every few months. I've only seen them a few times since I moved here. Recently, they came back and decided to have the tree in their front yard trimmed down before the next tenant arrived. Unfortunately, this tree belongs to the street, not to Karen, so she had no right to tamper with it. She knew this but made a half-assed attempt to call the HOA board. When they didn't reply right away, she took it upon herself to cut the tree. This morning, a group of workers came with a truck and loud power tools to cut several branches off the large tree. My neighbor, an Indian guy, let's call him R, came out first to complain, followed by the old lady. They have both lived here for a long time and understand the rules clearly. The conversation went something like this. R. Hey you can't cut that tree. Karen. Well, it's on my property. R. Actually, it's not. Tell them to stop cutting it. You need to contact the HOA first. Karen. I did, and they didn't respond, so it's not a big deal if I just trim it, okay? Old lady. Any change affects the value of the entire street and every house on it. You have to stop it. Karen. Oh my god, it's just a tree, give me a break, okay? For those who don't understand, our street has a common theme where every house has a similar design, and each house having a tree is part of that design. Stripping this mature tree down to a few branches completely ruins the look of the street. R. Walks up to the workers who are basically already finished, guys, please stop for now. Karen. Steps in front of R. Hey, back off. R. Puts his hand on her shoulder to push her away. Karen. Stop being aggressive. This argument went on for about 30 minutes. The whole time, Karen was extremely rude, interrupting people, and basically whining incessantly. Our old lady and the other neighbors watching knew they couldn't do anything without contacting the HOA first. They certainly didn't want to touch her, and they couldn't do anything with the workers because Karen had hired them. Her daughter didn't say anything and just stood at the doorway of their house. The workers continued with the tree, and in no time it was finished. About an hour later, R and old lady returned with news from the HOA. They explained to Karen that she couldn't touch the tree. Everyone knew that, but Karen didn't know the consequences. HOA policies dictated that she had to completely replace the tree. This meant hiring people to dig the tree out, paying for a new tree, paying for it to be planted, and paying for the lawn that would be inevitably torn up during the process. If she didn't comply, her house would be put on lien and no longer considered part of our private street. This meant Karen couldn't sell, rent, or refinance her property until she met these conditions. Even if she complied right away, her new tenant would be delayed at least a week or more while the tree was being replaced. Karen had a smug look of victory on her face at first, but it didn't last long. Realizing the financial hit she would take, she was furious. The total cost would be thousands of dollars for essentially nothing, just because she didn't consider those around her. I'm not entirely sure of the exact costs, but I expect it to be at least $10,000. This wasn't Karen's first time being a problem on our street. A long time ago, there was a rule that you couldn't park your car on your driveway. Most people thought it was a stupid rule, including me. The rule was set when the street was built to keep it looking nice or something. Karen took this rule way too seriously and kept giving tickets to old lady's husband. Before long, the entire street voted the rule out, seven to one, 
Guess who wanted to keep it? Karen also locked the back gate of the street and didn't give the key to anyone because she thought she was entitled to control who used the community gate. After this tree incident, Karen tried to argue that old lady's bamboo was falling into her backyard. Bruh, old lady was sick that day, and Karen was arguing with a sick old lady. Karen's daughter wasn't much better, but you can't really blame her for trying to defend her mother. She probably didn't understand what her mother had really done. The trees Karen cut were two cypress trees and a deciduous tree that grows red seeds in hard pods. The cypress trees were towering and magnificent. She trimmed them down halfway, and they will never regrow because they are at least 20 years old. Karen tried to change the subject and put the blame on old lady, but it didn't work. In the end, Karen had to face the consequences. She had to replace the trees and pay for the damages. If she didn't comply, her house would be put on lien, and she wouldn't be able to rent it out. It was a fitting end to her entitled attitude. So there you have it. Karen messed with the wrong tree and had to pay the price. Maybe next time she'll think twice before acting without considering others. Thanks for reading. My name is Ella, and I'm 28 years old. I've been married to my wonderful husband Jake for seven years now. But my marriage hasn't been without drama thanks to my sister-in-law, Heather. Heather has always tried to steal the spotlight, even back when Jake and I were just childhood friends. We've known each other since we were kids, and we would always talk about anything and everything. But Heather always wanted the attention. When Jake and I were in middle school, Heather had just graduated high school. Their parents threw a huge graduation party for her. Heather and her friends trashed the house, but her parents just brushed it off, saying, Kids will be kids. They even hired a maid to clean the entire house. Heather always got away with stuff because her parents enabled her. They weren't insanely rich, but they were well off, with a big house and three luxury cars. In high school, Jake and I started dating, and eventually got into a serious relationship. His parents loved me and showered us with affection and gifts. But Heather got jealous and desperately wanted the attention back. So, she came up with a plan to get pregnant by a stranger she met on social media. A month later, Heather announced her pregnancy at Jake's graduation party. Everyone congratulated her. But Jake's parents, Steve and Susan, gave her a disappointed look because she stole Jake's spotlight. I gave her a slight frown but congratulated her anyway, still trying to stay on her good side. She burst into tears, knowing Susan would talk to her after the party about how she shouldn't take Jake's spotlight. After her first child was born, things got worse. She eventually married a guy named Brad. He was okay but always enabled her actions. At their wedding, Heather made a 45-minute speech about their relationship. When Jake and I got married, Heather gave me dirty looks the entire time, treated the waiters like slaves, and made a complete fool of herself. I tried not to laugh when Susan told her to either stop being rude or leave. Heather chose to leave and flipped over a table with some wedding presents on it before storming out with Brad and her three kids. We carried on with the celebration after fixing the mess. When I announced my first pregnancy, everyone was ecstatic, but Heather pulled me aside and said, I wish you'd lose the baby. It's your fault our parents hate me now. I started sobbing, causing a lot of suspicion. Jake asked her what she said but she lied to his face. I told him later that night, and he was livid, he wanted to call her and yell, but I told him it would just fuel her ego, so we left it and went to bed. My pregnancy was awful. I could barely keep anything down and almost fainted twice in eight months. When I went into labor, the baby was stillborn. We were devastated. Heather then said, ah that sucks but you can always babysit my kids, they love their aunt and you can always have another baby, her kids were nice when they wanted something, but if we said no, they'd lose their minds, if we punished them, Heather would threaten to call the police for child abuse, which never happened, but she fooled us the first two times. What Heather said about my baby set Susan off. She pulled Heather aside and gave her a piece of her mind, I sat on the bed, bawling. How could anyone say that, after we just lost our baby, I lost all respect for Heather, I had spent years trying to be kind to her, but I was done. After a couple more tries and another lost baby, I almost lost all hope. But then our daughter was born. 
Heather was pissed that my first living child was a girl, but she couldn't do anything because she had already damaged her reputation. Heather got pregnant again with her fourth child. I supported her, wished her well, and gave her gifts, only to find out she threw them away. Seven months into her pregnancy, she lost the baby. No one was with her in the delivery room, except for Brad and her oldest kid. I felt bad for her because I knew how it felt to lose a child, but it was hard to sympathize after all those years of torment. Jake and I had another child, another girl, and we've been living happily without any contact from Heather since she lost her baby. Karma came back to bite her, and now we're free from her drama. This just goes to show. Treat people the way you want to be treated because karma is real, and it doesn't play favorites. Three years ago, I was at the local grocery store with my college friends. A little side note, I am autistic, and it is very uncomfortable for me when others touch me or speak to me aggressively. My friends went to the chips aisle to search for a particular brand of chips they liked while I went to gather ingredients for queso. It's important to note that I was wearing a green shirt in the same shade employees wore, but I was also wearing ratty jeans and sneakers. The scene is set, a single, 19-year-old gangly female reaching for some microwavable cheese blocks. Suddenly, I am whirled around by what I can only describe as a Karen Harpy from hell. Poorly dyed black hair, spray on tan, the works. For this stream of dialogue, I'm Sam, the skimpy teen, and the nightmare is entitled Karen. Karen. You, where are the gardening supplies? I've been looking everywhere for an employee, and here you are, probably not on break. Sam. Oh, this is a grocery store, ma'am. They most likely don't stock supplies for gardening. Also, I don't work here. Employees wear green shirts with black vests and name tags. Karen. Scoffs, that's nonsense. You're new, aren't you? Didn't listen during training? Well, I'm going to find your manager, and you, little missy, are coming with me. At this point, the freakish woman grabs my upper arm hard and practically drags me from my intended purchase. I'm shocked, scared, and eventually, my brain realizes this is a danger zone situation. I start struggling and telling her to let me go calmly but firmly. Sam. Ma'am please I don't work here, even if I did, this is a grocery store, they don't stock gardening tools. I am cut off by her sharply striking my face, she peers at me, as if I'm some troublemaking lazy teen that has gone unnoticed in the workplace. Karen. Listen young lady, where I come from we had to work our behinds off to get where we are, you parading around acting like you're on break is going to come to an end with me, understand? Now be a good girl for once and let me talk to your boss. I wait, tearing up quietly on a bench while my friends run up to me. They comfort me, with one of them saying that I should press charges for assault. Hell yes, I'm charging this woman. The manager walks over, assessing my appearance, and tells the woman that hit me that no, I do not work here. Before Karen can retort, I speak up. Sam. Sir, this woman has hit me and made threats against me. Can you call the police and have them see the security footage? The manager looks shocked. Manager, ma'am, is this true? Karen. Certainly not. This little brat told me to get lost when I was asking for assistance. What a piece of rancid nonsense. Manager. Well, this is a serious accusation, so I'm calling the cops anyway. The Karen turns tail and bolts. I can almost hear her fake tan behind clapping in the wind. My friends manage to coerce me into leaving the store and we go back to my apartment to eat and watch TV. Later, I got a house call from the cops with Karen in handcuffs. Turns out she had been shoplifting in that store for a little under a month by coercing younger college-age employees to check her out and forget to ring up things like expensive cuts of meat, bottles of wine, etc. The employees were all too scared to do anything because she had a photo R of the regional manager, who was her brother, and she claimed he would fire them if anything was reported. I told the cops my statement, and they took it straight to her brother, who despite being close to her, pressed charges for theft, assault, and other grievances. From what I can tell, the Karen goes in and out of jail these days for minor crimes. Now, a little backstory so you all can get the whole picture. When I started working at this location, I was young, still in college, and working two part-time jobs. At first it was just okay. I had been hired as a steward, which is just a fancy term for dishwasher. 
It wasn't too bad since it was the same job I had at the last restaurant I worked at. However, there were a few differences. I won't go into too much detail and name all of them, just the ones that are important to this story. The first one, and the one I liked the best, was that since there were so many restaurants, and the stewards were all in one department, we were shuffled around every day. One day, you would be working in the steakhouse, the next in the buffet, then the Italian restaurant, the sandwich shop in the bingo hall, and so on. This meant that you were always working with different people, interacting with them, and getting a change of scenery. I was told I was odd for liking this, but my counter was that if you did end up working with someone you didn't get along with, it would only be a while till you worked with them again. The second was that this place hated unions. Twice a year, there would be a meeting that everyone had to attend where they would make long presentations on how evil and manipulative unions were. Also, there would be signs all along the employee hallways with anti-union propaganda. After working for the casino for some time, my boss approached me asking if I wanted to be bumped from part-time to full-time. I said yes, as the benefits were really good. Not only did I get medical and dental insurance, but I would also get access to their lawyers, as well as a few other things. I guess it was a good thing that I did because a few months later, there were some major shakeups. I didn't know what caused it but most everyone there hated the new changes. For one thing, the sick note policy was cancelled. Meaning if you were sick, it wouldn't matter if you had a note from your doctor saying that you couldn't work. If you didn't show up, they docked you a point. This resulted in cooks and stewards coming in vomiting on the floor and in the trash cans because they couldn't afford to lose a point, as it would count against them when it came time for raises. Another thing they changed was that they were cutting the number of full-time employees. I was safe, along with everyone else who had that status. But if any of us left, that slot would not be filled. There would only be two full-time employees per department. Speaking of departments, that leads me to the next big change. Technically, the stewarding department would be disbanded. This meant that while our supervisors would still be there, it would be the chefs and managers of the restaurants that would be in charge of us. This also meant that we would no longer be moving around. I was sent to the steakhouse, and thankfully, I had two great female co-workers. In fact, we were so good that we were called Triple A, as all of our names began with the letter A as we worked there. I began to plan on moving up within the casino. I knew it would be difficult, but I had a dream of buying my family's cabin from my parents and living up in the country while I finished college. Sadly, my first attempt at becoming a supervisor failed, and I ended up training the person who got the job. I didn't complain, I just took it as a sign that I needed to up my game. Now, here our story really begins. See, our head chef was being transferred to the Italian restaurant, and the assistant chef was taking his place, meaning we were going to hire a new guy to take his place. Let's call the new guy Kevin. When Kevin first came in, he seemed okay. Not great or awful. He was just there, and we had no real reason to talk most days as we were usually pretty busy. Then, maybe a month after Kevin started working there, I had my first real interaction with him, and it, well, was something. It was at night, with the dinner rush just starting to pick up, and I told my co-workers that I was going to fill up my water bottle before it happened. They said okay, and that they would begin doing the same once I got back. But before I could leave the steakhouse to go to the break room, Kevin called out to me. Kevin, where are you going? Me, just getting a drink before we get busy, I told the girls. Kevin, then why aren't you using the waitstaff drink fountain? Me, blinking and confused. We were told when we started that staff are only supposed to get drinks from the break room. Kevin. Don't give me that. I see the wait staff getting drinks there all the time. You are just going there to waste time. I'm going to have to write you up for this. Me. Wasting time. The break room is just down the hall. In the time we've spent having this conversation, I could have gone down there, filled my bottle with ice, gotten my drink, and gotten back here. Kevin then opened his mouth, but before he could say anything, the head chef caught sight of us standing there, and came over to see what was going on. Before I could open my mouth, Kevin spoke up, explaining the whole thing with a superior look on his face. That, however, faded when the chef spoke. Chef, 
Kevin, op is right. Employees are only supposed to use the drink fountains in the break room. Sai, I'm going to have to talk to the waitress supervisor about this. Op, go get your drink. I need to talk to Kevin in private. So I did. After that, I was pretty much confused by what just happened. At first, I was willing to give Kevin the benefit of the doubt, believing that he honestly didn't know about that rule. Maybe chefs and supervisors were allowed to use the waitstaff station, and he assumed that it applied to everyone. However, when I brought this up to my co-workers, they said similar things had happened with them, that he had pulled them over for a minor infraction of the rules, and when they just said they were sorry, he let them off with a warning. So they suggested that he was just marking his territory, and would have gone easier on me if I hadn't questioned his authority. It was after that, however, that I began to notice things. Firstly, the wait staff was no longer talking with Kevin, as they were annoyed with him for causing the crackdowns at their station. It was during this time that I began to realize just how often he hung out with them. He was also always calling over my co-workers, asking them to help him with a job like peeling potatoes for hours, leaving me alone. What's more, whenever I stopped to speak with one of my supervisors, who happened to be a young woman, he would yell at me to get back to work. Slowly, I began to suspect that he had other intentions. These suspicions were later confirmed during that summer. For those of you who have never been in a professional kitchen, it can get hot. And in the summer, it can get really hot, and the odors can sometimes overpower you. On this day, I was working at one of our massive sinks, scraping off the remains of perch and giving the pans a deep clean when Kevin called me to the office. Now, this was odd, as I had only ever been called to the office to get my 10 cent raises while getting a performance evaluation, and neither of those were to happen until January. Curious, I followed him to the small room where he gestured for me to enter first. I did, finding a woman I had never met before sitting at one of the desks there. When I entered, she looked up from her work to give me a curious look that said, Hello, can I help you? You know the look. Then Kevin spoke as he shut the door, walking in backwards as he did. Kevin, op you stink. Woman, excuse me? At this, Kevin jumped before turning around. The woman was looking at him with rage while Kevin looked lost. It didn't take me long to realize that he didn't know she was in there. Kevin, sorry I misspoke. I meant he smelled bad were getting complaints about his body odor. Now like I said the room was small. So small that I felt cramped being in there with two other people. With the way we were positioned, I was pretty close to the woman, who was growing more annoyed. Woman. I don't smell anything, sir, would you mind if I get a little closer? I said it wouldn't be a problem, and allowed her to get close enough to sniff me. She did it maybe two or three times, before pulling away. Woman. I don't smell anything. That's when I spoke up. Op? Look, if someone said I smell, then I'm sorry. But I'm working over greasy sinks full of chemicals to clean off pans with fried perch on them in a room that feels like a hundred degrees. And on top of that, the aprons we are given are not the best. To emphasize my point, I gestured to my shirt, which was wet and full of bits and pieces of fish. Woman. I see. I'm going to have to take a look at those and see if any need replacing. Op? How about you cool down for a bit in the break room? Kevin, you stay. We need to have a talk. After that, three things happened. The first was that the stewards got new aprons, which made all of us happy, as they hadn't been replaced in years. Second, from then on, if Kevin wanted to talk to me about an issue, another staff member had to be there as a witness. And if there wasn't one, I was to find that woman, who I learned was the steakhouse manager. Third, all bets were off between me and Kevin. While he couldn't pull me to the side like that, he did start yelling at me whenever he could in public. If he caught me standing around, like when I was waiting for the dishwasher to fill up, he would yell at me to get back to work from across the room before going back to talk to one of the girls. He would berate me for any little thing, just to make me miserable. Soon, I came to realize that he saw me as an obstacle between himself and all the female staff members as I was on good terms with all of them. I even wondered if he thought I was like a harem protagonist based on how many I worked with. For over the next year, I tried everything in my power to stop him while still trying to get that supervisor position. 
I went to Human Resources, writing up complaints only for them to ask, what do you want us to do about this? And when I went to my head supervisor, he just said that I needed thicker skin. It seemed like every day it just got worse. On top of that, my identity was stolen twice. The first targeting my bank account, while the second one was my tax return. With the bank refusing to help and the legal department of the casino dragging their feet to help me, I was in the red for a long time, making my situation all the worse. There would be days when I would have to collect cans in the break room for gas and had to give away one of my cats. And with Kevin adding to my stress, there were days when I honestly thought about ending my life. Thankfully, there were good people still around. A bunch of my co-workers banded together to give me small packs of food, and some of the line cooks helped sneak out some meats that they were about to throw away. Then came the big night. It had been a concert night on one of the coldest nights of the year. So cold that several keys had snapped in the door locks because they had frozen shut. I had managed to get to my car and turn it on, leaving it running for a couple of minutes as I headed back to the locker room in order to enjoy my only comfort left a book. The plan was to just read a couple of pages, and then I would be out of there. But before I could get past my first paragraph, the doors to the locker room opened, and in strode Kevin. He looked around for a moment before his eyes fell on me, and a wicked smile appeared on his face. Kevin, who told you you could punch out up? Not me, that's for sure. I just got a complaint from the night crew saying that your dishwasher is a mess. Clearly, you didn't clean it at all. Now you go back there and clean it right now, and I'd better not see you punching in or else you'll be fired." With that he strode out of the room, laughing. For a moment, I just sat there in utter confusion, wondering if he could do that. I felt scared because if I lost my job, then I wouldn't know what to do. I was behind on my student loans. I had to drop out of college by this point due to various reasons, behind on paying my parents' rent, and could barely afford to keep the one cat I had left. For the first time in years, I felt so overwhelmed with fear that I felt like I could begin crying at any moment. Then the moment passed, and I was furious. This guy had been doing this to me for too long. It didn't matter if he could or couldn't. I was done with this. I had to get out of there. As I stood up, I found myself making a plan fueled by my rage. I had kept the fact that my identity had been stolen from my parents, partly out of shame and partly out of pride. As I wanted to get myself out of this mess, well, no more, I was going to tell them about it and ask if I could move back in with them. I would even ask for help looking for a new job down there. Sure, it would mean losing my dream home in the country, but at this point being stable was more important. But before I could do anything, another thought crossed my mind, making me smile. He wanted me to wash the dishwasher right now without punching back in. Okay, I'll do just that. So I left the locker room, barely hearing the security guard stationed nearby, as he called out to me. No, I ignored him and everyone else, as I mentally prepared myself to do this. When I got to the kitchen, there were piles of dishes, pots, pans, and a slew of other items that needed to be cleaned in quantities that are only ever seen on concert nights. But I ignored that, as well as the three stewards who were working hard shutting down the machine and emptying it. Night steward, what are you doing, op? Sorry, but Kevin told me that you told him that no one had cleaned the dishwasher and that it was a mess, so much so that I had to come back and clean it without punching in or else I would be fired. The color on everyone's faces drained. When the first person managed to compose himself, he told me that none of them had seen Kevin and that the machine was perfectly cleaned when they arrived. Now, Hearing this did make me feel bad as what I was doing would put them behind. But Kevin told me to do this, so I was following it to the letter, while also making sure everyone there knew who sent me, seeing that I wasn't going to stop. Not that it mattered at this point, as the machine had been drained. One of them went to get the night supervisor. While he was gone, the other two began to argue with each other over whether or not Kevin could order us to stay past our shifts and fire us if we refused. It didn't help that the casino had this nasty habit of offering employees a room to stay in when the roads were snowed over, only to make them work all night as they were on call. When the night supervisor came, she asked me what was going on. 
I repeated my story while cleaning the machine. She said that Kevin had not spoken to her and was gone before stating that he doesn't have the power to fire me. I just told her that I really couldn't take the chance. Then I asked her how to put in my two-week notice. That confused her even more, asking why I was doing this if I was just planning on leaving anyway. I told her that I would need time to make arrangements for my future, and that getting one last paycheck was important. So I wrote up my two-week notice, even mentioning why I was leaving before hitting the road. When I got home, it was 3 a.m., and with all the rage now out of my system, I just crashed onto my bed with my uniform still on. The next morning, I was awoken to the sound of my phone ringing. It was the casino. The head stewarding supervisor was asking if I could come in and talk about last night. At first, I told him no, that I couldn't come in early just to come back home. However, he said it was important. Curious, I told him I would be there in an hour or two. When I arrived, I was taken back to the steakhouse office to find it crammed with people. The night supervisor was still there, the night security officer was there, my supervisors were there, several head chefs were there, and the steakhouse manager was there, looking like her face would erupt into flames at any moment as she stared at the one figure who was sitting. It was Kevin, hunched over in his seat, looking like a child who was in time out. I was then told that they knew what happened. After I had my talk with the night supervisor, she went to security and found footage of Kevin looking out the door before heading toward the locker room and finishing off with him leaving with a grin minutes before I left the room. After that, she called in Kevin to show up the next morning. He tried to lie his way out of this, stating that it never happened, and I was just lying to get him into trouble. The supervisors then said that it was a simple matter to check, as they had the security guard who was by the room and that they could check the footage. Instantly, he remembered that he had spoken to me, only I had misheard him, and that he would never tell me to work without punching in. The night supervisor and the others in the room then asked, Why would Op lie? Who told you that the machine needed cleaning? Why would he be the only one who needs permission to leave? And so on. Over and over, Kevin tried to lie, only to change his story again and again until finally he realized he had been caught. The steakhouse manager then turned to me before apologizing, asking me if I would consider staying. The head manager also apologized, asking the same. For a moment, I was going to say no, but then, I had a stupid idea, that if I did this, then I might have a shot at becoming a supervisor myself and not have to leave. So I said sure, but only if Kevin never talks to me again. If he has a problem with what I'm doing, he'll have to run it by the head chef unless it's an emergency. They agreed. Later, I heard a few stories about why they finally acted. The first, and least likely in my opinion, was that this incident finally caused someone higher in the food chain to notice all the written complaints I had on Kevin, and was demanding answers. The second was that they didn't want to lose me just yet. Remember how I said that we used to move around from area to area? Well, it turns out there were now only two employees who knew how to work in every restaurant, meaning I could go into any area and know instantly where everything goes and how that area operates without wasting anyone's time. But the most likely reason was due to the union. News about what had happened the night before had spread throughout the casino faster than I ever could have imagined. And if they didn't take care of this, there was a greater chance that the union representatives would seize on it. In the end, I stayed in the steakhouse longer than Kevin did, as he left two years later. But before he did, I offered to throw a pizza party for everyone the day after he left. Update. There are plenty of questions and comments that people had. So I decided to write this up to answer as many of them as possible. First, the length. Did anyone read the first sentence of my post? It said right there that it would be a long one. So why complain when I told you in advance that it was long? For others who said that the first part was fluff, I wanted to paint a picture of the area I worked at, the conditions that I and others were under, as well as some things that would have been important later. Like the potential of me being one of the few people who knew how to work in every area helped me. Second, my car. Yes, I did turn off my car, 
Sorry that I forgot to mention it. Third, legal issues. Some of you have asked why I didn't try to sue the casino, Kevin, or just said that I should. To be honest, I did fantasize about doing just that. However, seeing how the casino is on Native American land, any and all legal issues were brought before a council. And it was well known that any time an employee tried to go before them, the house was more likely to win. Also, given my financial state, I didn't believe at the time I could afford a lawyer or what would happen if we lost. Fourth, why I stayed so long. This was something I had thought about including in my original post but decided against because of the length. The sad reality was that there were not a lot of good paying jobs at that point in time due to a recession. So jobs were hard to find. Now I could have tried to transfer to a different department. But remember how I talked about being a full-timer? Well, at the casino, when you transferred to a different department, you had to start from the bottom meaning whatever raises you had gotten would have vanished. Not only that, but I would have lost my full-time status. So not only would I take a hit to my paycheck, but I would also have lost my benefits, like health and dental. I admit that I was too scared to go on without them for an unforeseeable amount of time. Fifth, Kevin's punishment. At the time, I was just happy to know that something was being done, even if I couldn't see it, now there are a few of you who said I should have asked for his job, but the problem is that's not how it works. An assistant chef is not a position that just anyone can take, as it takes years to learn and work up to. I did not have the skills or the training to even become a line cook at the time. Sixth, the ending. Once again, sorry, as I know that it does feel unsatisfying. I know many of you were expecting something more grand. However, this is something I have learned in life, that you will rarely ever get the grand finale. Instead, I have learned to accept my victories when I get them, and move forward. Sadly, I never did get to keep the cabin. While I did manage to work my way out of the identity theft issue, I never did get the supervisor job that I had been working for. In the end, I gave up when they told me the reason I didn't get the job was because, Op, you follow the rules too well. That was the final straw. Still, life has gotten a thousand times better for me. Because I stayed in this place, I was able to meet the love of my life. Shortly after that final rejection, I extended my search to find a new job. While the cabin and home I love so much are gone, I now have my own home with my wife. So in the end, I am living a comfortable life. I call that the best revenge. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences and opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.